Good afternoon, folks. I am going to be reviewing exam number one. And um, the results were mixed. Uh, I had some very strong exams uh, from a number of students uh, and some not so great exams from quite a few others. And so um, anytime I run into that situation, I always feel like um, I need to look at the materials that I've provided and how things were presented and so forth. And I think the students also have to ask themselves the question, are they putting in the time that is warranted, keeping in mind that this is a three unit class that is running on a compressed schedule. And so the typical rule of thumb with a three unit class is that you do three times the amount of work as the number of units uh, in terms of hours in a week. So um, nine hours a week would be a reasonable expectation. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, are not feeling like you did as well on the exam as you would have hoped, you might look at the amount of time that you're spending with the material, with the readings, with the lectures, uh, with, you know, the recorded screencasts that have put, put forth, uh, the assignments and what have you. Keep in mind that, uh, you've got basically a, a split of a third of the course that is based on uh, the exam. So you've uh, taken the first of these. Uh, you'll do three of these uh, exams. So there are two more. Um, the assignments, the 50 point assignments, and then um, these content review and discussions. So you have, have a 10 point discussion out there. And again, I'm seeing um, some folks that are really engaging in the discussions and, and I can see the amount of time that they're spending on the course and those folks tended to do pretty well on the exam. Some other folks that are, you know, missing discussions and, and aren't spending quite the, the amount of time needed in the course. And I understand that uh, these online classes can be challenging and that uh, you don't have the reminders all the time. It really takes a lot of initiative uh, and keeping an eye on your emails and so forth. But uh, with that said, my uh, goal is for each and every one of you to be successful in the class, and I'm always available for responding to emails or looking through um, meeting with you either in my office or on the phone if you would like that sort of assistance. Okay, so with that said, um, I want to go through the exam, and um, we will start off here with the first question. So there are a number of map questions here that were relating back to this um, fundamentals of geographic representation. This was also the focus of, exam, uh, of assignment number one. There was some various terms and concepts that were reviewed. So in this particular case, this is uh, the process of geo-referencing when you take uh, a historic or some other kind of image that's not registered and reference it to something that has known coordinates and known locations, um, in this case uh, in uh, Google Earth. Okay, so maps are geographic representations of Earth's surface kind of the general background we started with how we reference things in um, geography and in geographic space using maps. And there were a number of fundamental cartographic principles, uh, one of which is scale. So the level of detail and the area covered on a map is determined by scale. These are two maps that are showing the same area at different scales. This one has less detail showing a bigger area, more detail, a smaller area. That is a function of scale. Okay, so the, uh, the third question here is referring to uh, the role um, of mapping in the digital revolution. So which of the following plays the most significant role in the digital, notice the italics, the digital revolution that has changed mapping, communication, and so many other aspects of life. And that is the representation of data in binary format. That was in uh, one of the early lectures. Question number five, uh, what general type of map is this? Uh, this is an ISO line map. Um, contour lines represent lines of equal elevation. OK, 
Okay, this is um, the definition of geography. Okay, Earth's physical and cultural landscape through spatial distribution patterns and connections. Question number six. John Snow did the initial spatial analysis. Mercator created the great navigation map with the projection that still bears his name. Harrison solved the problem of longitude. Ptolemy came up with latitude and longitude, and Aristophanes determined Earth's circumference using mathematical principles. Again, all of these were in the lectures, so uh, a good study and, and having your sort of notes available, since that's something that you have at your disposal when you're taking these exams. Uh, should have assisted you with that. In terms of this question, it was just a chance for you to use this concept of pattern and to kind of focus your attention on a geographic place that you're familiar with. And one of the things that most of you sort of ascertained from this is that we had this pattern of predominantly heavier rainfall in the eastern half of the United States than the western half. I was kind of looking for a little bit more detail. You'll notice that the colors are much more uniform, meaning they cover large areas. And in the west, you see much more a fragmented pattern where you see localized areas of higher precipitation in green, uh, interspersed with a lot of areas of very dry, arid conditions. And then, as a lot of you pointed out, a very heavy precipitation pattern along the Pacific Northwest. Um, these other areas are areas of mountains. That's why we see these higher precipitation areas. Again, the idea being just to describe these locations. Um, this is an example of a choropleth map where you have areas that have values associated with them. All areas within the geographic extent have a value. It's the definition of a choropleth map. Um, Universal Transverse Mercator, it's a useful alternate coordinate system to the geographic coordinates of latitude and longitude that we're so familiar with. Uh, most folks got this one, I think. This is orientation. Uh, Hatchers, again on assignment number one and in the lecture on geographic representation, the way that we used to represent mountains, not used today. Okay, if we look at spatial analysis, uh, this is an example of connectivity, the ability to connect locations based on a linear network. This is true. Maps employ abstraction to simplify reality and make order out of our complex world. That's why we create maps. Okay, these are uh, coordinates of latitude and longitude in decimal degrees. Latitude, always a number between 0 and 90. Longitude, a number between 0 and 180. And by convention, usually latitude first, longitude second. And the negative value in this case indicates a west longitude. If we were in the southern hemisphere, latitude would be shown as, wet, as a negative number. These folks did well on that question. Uh, hill shade or shaded relief is uh, the answer to that question. Either of those worked. Okay, let's do some definitions here. Um, computer systems, this was in the very first lecture, computer systems for the input, management, analysis, and display of spatial data. This is the core geospatial technology, and as a consequence, it, it actually has more elements to it, right? Input, analysis, and display. This comes up later in the exam. Okay, so GPS is a navigation system based on satellites. Remote sensing uses raster-based data produced from satellites and analyzed on computers. That's the image processing side of it, is the computer processing. Okay, everyday, right, the popular geographics, everyday computer and mobile device applications for 
not only navigation, but viewing places and various other tasks. And then finally, geoservices, applications that improve efficiency and safety. A lot of routing applications with those. Okay, so um, the concept of Web 2.0 is best illustrated by um, the use of um, volunteer geographic information. This is feeding data back. That's the 2.0. Instead of just receiving information, we're now pushing it back out onto the web, and VGI is designed to accomplish that task. Okay, so this was a question. Uh, we had a lecture and a reading talking about environmental sustainability, so you could have addressed topics such as um, species extinctions or energy consumption or water availability. Uh, resource availability in general, and describing how geospatial technologies in particular can apply to those things, keeping in mind that geospatial technologies include geographic information systems, global positioning systems, remote sensing, and I was looking for you to develop a paragraph where you demonstrate that you understand what these different elements of of geospatial technologies do, and in turn, how that specifically can support environmental sustainability. So for example, we might gather data with remote sensing. That might be put into a geographic information system, cross-referenced against data on species at risk or <clears throat> resource consumption, those sorts of things, and then analyzed and displayed for um, better interpretation better understanding. Okay, there's a number of these. Um, OpenStreetMap is probably the best example. The key thing is that you're provide that uh, everyday users can use free applications to provide geographic information, mapped information that uh, can be consumed by the larger po population, volunteered geographic information. Okay, so this is sometimes described as asserted as opposed to authoritative. You're not relying on a government agency or something to map data, but rather everyday citizens. Okay, so um, which of the following VGI technologies allows for the creation of mapped features from street addresses and coordinates? That would be geocoding in the lecture for that week and the reading. Okay, describe... Uh, an essential, uh, an example of each of the following three GIS essential functions, data management, analysis, and visualization. Um, this was a question that a number of folks uh, did fine on. Um, there was actually uh, a number of you that did not answer the question at all, which uh, led me to decide that I had not addressed this sufficiently. So the exam is curved to the extent that rather than you could have been graded out of six points, but um, on the exam, it only turns out to be worth one. So the total score for the exam is out of 45 instead of 50. So you could have gotten extra credit points there. And uh, so I'm going to spend some more time with this because it's really important. But basically, um, data management means storing geographic information in geographic databases in a way that is structured and ordered and allows us to store different data that we can relate to other data and that we can provide ancillary information. How is the data collected? Uh, and we can aggregate all this data from different sources together. That's data management. Analysis is doing what-if scenarios, using queries and overlays to be able to understand relationships in our data. You can do predictive modeling. What is sea level rise going to look like if we get three centimeters of sea level rise? Uh, and then visualization is maps, but it can also be animations, 3D representation, and so forth. Okay, so uh, grid cell was the correct answer for this one. Um, Google Earth, Google Maps, MapQuest, lots of these. And this is true. I'll see you online.